Hello, I'm Ben Street. I'm an art historian based in London and I'm very happy to be here with Masterpiece talking about materials. This month I've chosen to talk about wood. As ever, I've chosen four different objects that are from a very wide range of different historical periods, different geographical locations, and that's deliberate because what I really want to do is explore the different ways in which materials have been used, can be used, and how, perhaps more importantly, how materials can be meaningful and how they can have a kind of human connection with us. Now the objects I've chosen today are kind of interesting in terms of the real diversity, I think, in terms of the way wood can be deployed in art. And of course, when we think about wood, we think of something that was an abundant material that could be used for an enormous diversity of things. You know, you think about the applications of wood in terms of human civilization. You think of burning wood, you think of fire, but you also think of things like paper, or you think of furniture, or you think of um, even cutlery, bowls, plates, jewellery. There's lots of applications for wood. And of course, within the category of talking about wood, there's an enormous range of different kinds of wood because wood behaves, obviously, as, as I'm sure you know, it, in a really wide range of different ways, depending upon what kind of wood it is and how that wood is treated. So the, what, the object I wanted to start with is an object that has within itself an enormous range of different kinds of wood. This is an object that is kind of between things. It's between a painting and a sculpture. It's between fine art and applied art. It's between an object and architecture. It's, it's between lots of different things. And, and one thing that's always, I think, worth looking at when we look at the history of art, it's always worth looking at things that are somewhere in the margins, somewhere that are between things. And that's that's often where the most interesting work happens, you know, somewhere between things. Now this is called intarsia, or we might call it inlay. In other words, it's a an object that has been made of lots of very small pieces of wood that have been laid in side by side, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, those woods are very are, are very varied. I mean, it's actually based upon a, a walnut frame, but the different kinds of woods that are contained within it are, 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 very, are very diverse. And the different kinds of woods that have been chosen, and it's probably clear, have been chosen because of their colour. They've been chosen because they are made to stand for different parts of a lighted object. So that's what I mean. When I say this is an object that is kind of like a painting, it's because it has a it's like it has its own light source inside it. It's got light passing from the left. It's not the light source of us as we look. It's like a fictional light source, an illusionistic light source. And of course, the big phrase that we might be talking about in a work like this is illusion, because it's something that is full of what you might call trompe l'oeil or tricking the eye. The objects that you see within it feel even now very real and it's possible for your eye to be fooled and to believe that what you're facing is a kind of cabinet that's opened up. The black, the black back of the cabinet allows objects to be thrown into relief and so we can see a book and a goblet and a clock and lots of different kind of objects that suggest a kind of unkempt or, or badly maintained or, 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 or ransacked cabinet even. This is a, a kind of form of wood making that was popular in the Italian Renaissance, which is indeed where this comes from. I mean, it's an early 16th century object, probably made by somebody called Fra Raffaello de Brescia. So it's a, somebody from Brescia, in northern Italy, who trained, probably trained in Ferrara in north central Italy, which is where intarsia panels like this, that's where the kind of technique was really developed in Ferrara. Um, but you know he was he was a uh, he was a monk. I mean that's why he's called Fra or Brother uh, de Brescia. So he was um, he made it possibly made it for a monastery which is just out of Ferrara. We don't know for sure. And it, and in fact that's by the by to some extent because what's interesting is the fact that a certain kind of degree of extraordinary skill and precision in cutting and placing wood retains its ability to fool our eye even now. But what are these things that are fooling our eye? I mean, we have a chalice, 
we have a religious object. We have a religious book, which looks like it might be a prayer book or the Bible, held open at a particular place, not a random place, but a specific place that's been chosen to create a certain kind of effect. So it's not just a sort of magic trick, this sort of illusion, it's also a way of meditating especially if you're a monk, if this indeed was in a monastery, which seems to be what the historical record tells us, it, it's not just, I suppose what I'm saying is, it's not just a kind of uh, a frippery, it's not just a kind of fun illusion, it's also a way of thinking about the nature of what constitutes reality and what constitutes something divine, because this is very much something of the earth. It's made out of wood which comes from forests, you know, this was made at a time when Europe was much more densely forested than it is now. So the presence of wood as a visual thing, the presence of literal trees, was much more much more felt, I think, at this time. You, you'd be much more exposed to wood in your life than you probably would be in the 21st century. So taking wood and transforming it into something which perhaps reflects upon the nature of illusion, the nature of reality, and ideas of religion and spirituality is really powerful. I suppose what I'm trying to suggest really is that although wood to us, although it's very present in a lot of our lives, it was much more of a kind of everyday, an indicator of the everyday, I would say, than it would have been at this particular point. Now look, I'm not suggesting that intarsia panels were everyday. This kind of extraordinarily precise working with wood was very labour intensive and consequently expensive and consequently quite rare. I mean, the other thing is, obviously, a lot of it doesn't survive because it burns very easily, but the works, that, the panels that have survived tend to be in quite rarefied environments. I mean, you, there's a famous kind of intarsia room in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was the Studiolo. In other words, it was, it was a personal study. It was somebody's study. So it usually tends to be places where there's a sort of studious or academic or spiritual quality to it. I mean, so, so in other words, there's a, there's, there's a kind of expectation that's created by the environment it was made for that, like, that gives it an extra sort of aura, perhaps you might say. But intarsia work, this kind of work, was too often in art history relegated to being mere craft. Um, you know, this was made at the time of Michelangelo. So you might say, well, Michelangelo's sculptures represent a kind of fine art where this de Brescia represents a kind of um, an applied art. I think that given what the way our attitude towards craft has shifted or the way our attitude towards applied art and design has shifted over the years, this kind of work becomes much more interesting or exciting to us than it might previously have done. Um, I think it's an incredibly exciting thing to look at because it retains its ability to fool the eye. It retains its ability to wow us while at the same time, hopefully, or at least that's the intention, lead us on to more, maybe more rarefied thoughts.